Good morning. Hey, it's good to be back home. I tell you, over the sitting, standing over there in in Quitman and, and talking to folks every once in a while, I catch myself saying, "Well, back home we did." And so you know, and and we lived here 15 years, as long as I've ever lived in any one place in my whole life. And our phone number 887-2286 had it for the longest time too. So I want, I'm going to call them and see who I've got. Wait a minute, let me call them right now. Who's got? Hello. This morning's lesson, uh, what a living God means. Turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice, to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Now, is, um, Pharaoh was considered to be a descendant of the sun god Ra. So he was a demigod, a semi-god, and he was worshipped as such. And as a matter of fact, every one of the plagues, the ten plagues of Egypt, were against one of the gods of, of, of Egypt. It was a direct assault. The, the, the darkness was against the sun god Ra. And they worshipped out. Every one of those plagues was against one of their gods. And, and when they got over to the, um, to the lice, that affected man and beast, they couldn't even offer a sacrifice because all of their sacrifices were defiled and they couldn't even go to their God. What are you going to do? Then over in Exodus chapter 7, the first five verses, and the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. <clears throat> Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he send the children of Israel out of his land, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Even the, the, the death of the firstborn, was an assault against one of their gods. And the firstborn of Pharaoh also died, which was so-called a child of one of their gods, being Pharaoh. Now, I learned a long time ago that I'm driving nails. I need to hold that nail with a pair of pliers. My thumb appreciates that. So I'm thinking somewhere in there, Pharaoh should have understood that he needed to get a pair of pliers because he was not doing very well at all. Matter of fact, he was about 0 and 10 when it comes to competitions. Turn your Bibles back over to Genesis chapter 1. We'll be looking at that <clears throat> as we go through this. Now existence demands a beginning, a source, excuse me just a minute, <clears throat> demands a source or beginning power that is capable of creating and then sustaining that which is created. Science tells you that every effect must have a cause greater than itself and prior to itself. You know, go start up your car. Your car needs you to go out and crank the engine for it to go. All right. So Genesis 1 and verse 1 is just such a force of powers having the capability. And science tells us again that, as I said, every effect must have a cause that is superior to and prior to the effect itself. And that cause or effect, or force rather, must be can be best thought of as the uncaused first cause. Now, why is all this important? And that's the importance of the idea of a living God, not some thought, not some hope, but a real being, a real force, an intellect. I mean, however you choose to think of it, it has to be there. So having a living God means we have an explanation for existence. Science as science cannot explain existence. <clears throat> Science, by definition, is the examination of testing and reporting on phys physical phenomenon. It cannot acknowledge, as science, it cannot acknowledge the supernatural. That's untestable. You can't get it under, underneath the microscope. You can't take a sample of it. You can't do a test on it. You can't pour chemicals on it. 
You can't, science cannot do anything about the supernatural. And that's why a lot of scientists just outright deny God, a, 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 an outside force, because then they'd have to recognize that they are powerless in the face of some things. So notice the logical sequence of getting here. How did, how did this get here? And again, science only has theories, and those theories are untestable. So if you look at Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. He created the stuff, as I call it. It may not be the most technical term, but he created the stuff that he started working with going forward. That was in verses 1 and 2. Now, if you look at then verses 3 beginning, the first day is light. Day and night was created. Now, how did he create light without a light bulb or without some source, without a star? Uh, he's God. Thinking if he could say, let there be, and there was, and I'm thinking he can handle it. Now, I don't know how he did it. I don't, I, it's, like, it's like electricity. I don't care how it works as long as when I flip that switch, it works. That's all I care about. I don't know how all of this works. It'd be interesting to know, but frankly, don't care. I'm just glad that it does. And then we go on the second day, the firmament's created, verse 6 beginning. And the third day, water and dry land is separated, and then vegetation comes forth. Now, now again, notice the logical sequence. If he created a vegetable and just hung it out there, and then he, before he created water and dirt, what would that plant do? And by the way, notice that each one of these sections is a day and a night. And then you have the first one, then you have the second one, then you have the third one. The importance of that is, is on the second day when he created vegetation, it was a 24-hour period. It couldn't have been eons of time because here you have this broccoli plant hanging out there in the nothingness. And it's going to die in about a day or two. Because it has no oxygen, it has no water, and it has no nutrients for its roots. So what are you going to do with it? Another thought when you think about this is the yucca plant and the yucca moth. Without the moth, you don't have a yucca plant. Without the yucca plant, you don't have a yucca moth because they, symbiotic, is that the word teacher? Okay, see, there's my science. Miss, Mrs. Linder, biology class, biology one would be proud of me right now. So they're, they're symbiotic. You can't have one with the other. If you don't have one, you're not going to have the other very long at all. One of them's going to starve to death shortly. And if you've got eons of time and vegetables created and then somewhere down the road you've got millions and billions of years and then you've got the moth, what's the moth going to eat because the plant's dead? All right, science can't answer that. They say it's just happened. Now, you look on verses 9 through 13, about verse 13 it says it was good. So here we have the idea of good being introduced. On the fourth day, verses 14, you have the moon, the sun, the stars... Um, and he says it was good. The fifth day, you got fish and fowl, and it was good. And on the sixth day, which is really the important one, verse 24 beginning, we have the land animals after their kind. Even though chapter 1 doesn't say it, doesn't say it Adam and Eve was created in there in the Godhead image, verses 26 through 28. And if you look over chapter 2, verses 7, and then verse 8 beginning, verse 25, you have the first family coming together. Adam, on that sixth day, sometime on the sixth day, Adam named all the animals. Now, here's another. This, this occurred to me also. There's Adam. Let's say, let's say for the sake of discussion, he's created in the morning. He opens up his eyes, looks around, and uh, he's hungry. What's he going to eat? He's going to eat, say he's going to eat an orange for the sake of discussion. Now, that tree had to be old enough to have fruit on it for Adam to eat. Now, whatever plant it was he ate from, I don't know. I don't care. It's immaterial. He had to have something to eat. And that something had to be mature enough by that time to produce something for Adam to eat. Now, I know for a fact that it takes a citrus tree about three to five years to start producing fruit. So that tree had to be, had to, had to appear, apparently, to be at least three years old. But it's literally just hours old. Chronologically, it's only about 24 to 48 hours old. But yet it appeared to be three years. How old was that, plant, that, that oak tree 
that's producing, how old was it? If he'd cut it down, how many rings would it have had? Well, did God lie to Adam and Eve? No. I don't know what he said to them. He walked in the garden with them, as you can see from uh, uh, Acts chapter, Acts chapter three, Genesis chapter 3. So he was probably telling them about what all is going on and what's happening and all the details and stuff. Imagine Adam wanting a glass of milk. Where are we going to get that from? Okay. Somebody had to tell him. Now, we don't know what all God told him. But anyways, the point I'm making here is the logical sequence of all of this. So if Adam picked up a rock, how old would that rock have appeared? It rock would have appeared to have been billions of years of age. But how old was it? About uh, 90, um, just a couple hours old. All right, now, how old is our earth? I tell you what, I don't think it's older than 10,000 years. <gasps> okay, all right, that's another sermon. Come back next, well, I will be here next week. There's a sermon. You're not writing this down, son. Okay. So they bore after their kind, Adam and Eve, on the sixth day is the family created, because Adam looked around and he said, you know what, there's nobody for me. After he named all these animals, and they're doing animal stuff, he's saying, there's nobody for me. And Adam, God put him to sleep, and then, Brought Eve to him, and by the way, you know why a woman's called woman? Adam saw Eve, and he said, whoa, man. There you go. Now, what has been created at this time has been called perfect. God saw that it was very good. It wasn't just good. When Eve was created, the apex of creation, God saw that it was that evening, he said it's very good. Now, Dr. Thomas Warren, in his book, Have Atheists Proved There Is No Evil, is actually, actually his doctoral thesis. He says that God had created the perfect veil of soul making. And if you look at Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, the only law the first couple had to obey, the only laws, was to be fruitful and multiply, verse 28, chapter 128. They were addressed and to keep the, keep the garden, chapter 2 and verse 15. They were to avoid eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, evil in chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. And obviously they failed miserably in that effort. Now I don't know how long after they got up and around were doing stuff that it took them to partake of that fruit. And if you pushed me, I, I would have to tell you it probably wasn't very long at all. Now what was, what was that tree? We don't know. I mean, that's called it was an apple. You know, we just don't know. And I'll be honest with you, I, it, it, in my, I don't have any humble opinions, but in my opinion, I just don't think it was any different from any other tree. If it had been an apple tree, it would have been one tree in the whole midst of a whole bunch of them. If it had been a, a, an orange tree, it had been one tree in the midst of a whole bunch of them. But God said, that one right there, that specific one, don't eat of it. Don't touch it, don't go near it, because the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, they had to understand something about death because when they partook of that tree, they should have died right then and there. But they didn't. So that gets down into what we're going to talk about here in the next section is that, is that God had a plan. So man is accountable to God for his own actions. Each of us are accountable for what we do as individuals. And on the day of judgment, we're going to be standing before God to give an account for the things we've done in the body, whether good or evil, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. So it behooves us to be careful about what we do. Now, now if you look at Genesis 3 and verse 15, we have this, what's called the proto-gospel, if you want a, a, a theological accurate term for it. It's just whether you agree with it or not, that's what some folks have called it. But they call it the proto-gospel, Genesis 3 and verse 15. He says, and God said moreover, no, 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 that's Exodus. Let me get back to Genesis 3. So in Genesis 3 and verse 15, he says, and I will put enmity, speaking to the devil, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it, her seed, singular, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, you're going to get a crushing blow, and you're just going to hurt him a little bit. And that's the first instance of the, of the plan being mentioned that God had. In Revelation 13 and verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not, are, are not written in the book of the, of the 
in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God hath that cannot lie, promised before the world began. And Peter in 1 Peter 1, 19 says, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained, predetermined, preplanned, before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So what that tells us is, even before creation, God had in mind a plan that he knew would be necessary for man's salvation because he knew that man, created in his image, a free moral agent, able to, to pick and choose and decide, would make a mistake. Well, so God, God designed us to fail. No, God designed us to live. I was listening to a, a sermon on the way down here from polishing the pulpit, as a matter of fact. And this guy was a, excuse me, this guy was a chaplain. He, he does, was doing chaplain, the chaplaincy, chaplaincy work for, oh, for various and sundry nursing homes and things. And his brother had cancer and was dying. His brother's a member of the church. And he, he told the, the fellow, the, the, the preacher that was in the lesson, he says, it's hard to die. Boy, isn't it? And what he was saying was, and, and what, the, what the preacher said, what the conclusion he drew was, is we were not designed to die. We were designed to live immortal, to, 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 to be immortal, in essence. But because we lost access to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, God kicked them out. Two cherubims with flaming swords, keeping them from going back in. We lost access to the tree of life, and that's why we're in glasses, and that's why we're having health problems, and that's why we fall and break our legs, and, and folks die. That's why. All because of what Adam and Eve decided to do lo those many years ago, and here we are today. Now here's some conclusions, at least some, that we can draw from this discussion. Somebody else might draw a whole list more, and I think they should. But God, able to see down through time, knew what was needed and was likewise able to enforce his will. He knew what needed to be done and he was able to enforce it. He just didn't say, don't do that again. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to give you time out. Now, my dad just said, don't. <laughs> no, okay, okay. Isaiah 46 and verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. And then it's going to happen because that's what I want. Isaiah 48 and verse 3, I have declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them, I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. I have even from the beginning declared it to thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou should say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. So the thing that I created, that I carved out of wood and coated with silver, that I offer sacrifices to, my God is the one that did this. I find it interesting, I believe it's in Isaiah, that you have Isaiah saying you cut a tree down, you take a portion of it down to the, basically the idol maker, and he car or the carpenter carves it out, and then you take it over to the silversmith, and he coats it with silver, and then you take the rest of that tree stump, and you cook bread with it. <laughs> it makes a good idol, and it bakes some pretty good bread. What's wrong with this picture? Secondly, God is able to create something from nothing. Has sufficient power to institute and enforce law. Okay, if he can bring all this into existence, somebody says, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. God said, let it be, and bang, there it was. Okay, so if he could create something from nothing, then surely he has the power to enforce his will. And again, 
the references I have down here I've already referred to to some extent. Won't take the time to do it again. But, but he's telling, in Genesis 3, he's telling Adam and Eve what the situation is going to be and why. Because of what you have done, this is what's going to happen. And it happened that way. Now, why didn't they go back into the garden? God kicked them out. Well, why didn't they go back in? Because there's two angels standing there with flaming swords. Have no idea what an angel looked like, what the cherubim looked like. I, I'm sure they were imposing. But not only what they looked like, but they had a flaming sword. It's got to cause an impression of some sort. The third one here is God observes all and a record is kept. I don't know if we have that hymn in this book. Raymond and I talked about this. There's an all-seeing eye watching you, watching you, watching you. Okay, I don't know if it's in this hymn book. But it's based on Proverbs 15.3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Every place. If I were to give you a globe of the world, or a map of the world, and I would ask you to show me the place on that map, that God, that the eyes of God don't see. Which place on there doesn't God, isn't God able to look at? And the answer, of course, would be, well, there's no place on there because it says all, all places. He's in all places. There's no place left out of all. All places are included in all. It's a complete set. That's the extent of my math right there, too, by the way. So, here we have a being that sees all this. Hebrews chapter 4, 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Now, I'm not asking for a show of hands because I don't want anybody to embarrass myself. Who among here is not a creature? Okay, let the record show at least they're smart enough not, not to raise their hand. Okay? Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things, there we go again, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, what doesn't he know? What, doesn't, what is he not able to see? Of what instance is he not aware of? The answer is zero. Doesn't that make you pause and reflect? Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, the books, plural, and another book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Uh, in Matthew 12, 33 and 34, good and evil flows from our hearts. We are the source of the evil that takes place in this world. It flows from our hearts. I, I'm sorry, I, it doesn't say good, it says evil. And God knows our hearts. So do you think maybe we need to purify ourselves? Do you think maybe we need to be following the word of the Lord and doing what he says to do in the manner in which he said to do it? So in the third place, third main point, what it means to be created in God's image. And again, this is just a few things. Because we are in God's image, now not physically, but spiritually. For God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. First of all, we are free moral agents able to choose our own behavior. Genesis 3 and verse 6. Eve, when Eve saw that the fruit and, and the parlance of this passage was good to eat and good to see, good to look upon, and good to make us wise, she partook. She decided, but God said don't eat it, but she said, you know, it looks pretty good and I want to be pretty smart. So she partook of it. Joshua 24, 15, if Joshua is getting to the end of his career, he gathers all Israel together and says, Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So it's a matter of choice. We choose our actions. We choose our words. We choose our thoughts. Well, it just popped up in my mind. Well, change the channel. Change the channel. Don't think that way. Whatsoever the things are pure or just with any virtue, what does he say? Think, Philippians 4, verse 8. Think on these things. What should our mind dwell on? Why should I study? To show myself approved unto God. Because I'm thinking the pure things that I ought to think. We need to change our minds. Secondly, God has always been precise in what he expects from man. 
And in John 12, verse 48, the words that I've spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. So what did Jesus say about anything? Well, let's find out. Now, there may not be a specific thou shalt or thou shalt not, but there are principles involved in the, New, in, in the Scripture, general and certainly in the New Testament, that tells us how we are to behave in any given situation. The illustration I gave years ago here was years before I got here, there was a fire back there in the nursery, and smoke just filled this auditorium. Now, I would imagine that if this building were to be remodeled and you are to take down these slats, you would probably find soot up there in the overhead somewhere. Well, how did it get there? It got there because of air. It, smoke goes wherever it can go. It fills in every little nook and cranny, and you'll find it. The house we lived in up in Pennsylvania, in the Pittsburgh area, um, it, had, it, it years ago, everything up there was fired by you heated. If you heated, you were heating with coal. I mean, that's, all, that's how you got heat. You put fire and coal in the furnace. And uh, I was up in the attic and, and looked in one of the, in the open joists, and you could see soot you, like that, and you get coal dust on you. And, it's, and that was 70 years after they got rid of the coal-fired furnace in that house. You can still see soot. Soot was everywhere in that house. I mean, on the inside of the walls. So the gospel's like that. There's not a nook or cranny in your being that isn't covered by some principle in the Scripture. Every word, thought, or deed is governed by the Scripture. Somebody said, I don't like that. So I understand that. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. You know, so I, that's embarrassing too. It means, in the third place, that we can hear God's Word, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We can choose to live by it. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, we, we order our lives the way God says to do it and not the way we want to. And we receive the consequent rewards, Matthew 25, verse 34. We either live according to his, uh, not according to his will, and we go into everlasting damnation, or we live according to his will and go to heaven. There's the two choices. Somebody says, I don't believe all that. Okay. It's not going to work out well for you. Well, that's harsh. Yeah, and hell is long and hot, too. It's not saying something you can't find in the Scripture. And finally, it also means that we can reject God's plan. Matthew 23, 37, Jesus saying, I would have gathered all Jerusalem to my, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. I would have gathered you together like a hen gathers its chicks. I was out of my, my grandfather's barnyard one time. My grandma Grace sold eggs to make some money, egg money, egg money, okay? <laughs> and, and, and I was out there watching the chickens. There was a mama chick out there with her, chicken out there with her, with her chicks. And all of a sudden she clucked. And went like this, and those kids come running. And I saw a shadow of a hawk pass over. Look up, there it was. Mama saw the chick, saw the hawk. She called the kids, gathered them up underneath their wings. Jesus said, I would have gathered you like a chicken gathers her chicks. And ye would not. You chose your destruction. And we're going to reap the consequences of our actions. Matthew chapter 25 and 40. Actually, 25 and 34 is God saying, come into the rest prepared. And, in, and in, down in Matthew 25 and verse 41, he's saying, depart from me, I never knew you. Had to get that one straight. Galatians chapter 6 says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit leap, reap everlasting life. Those are the only two choices. There's not a gray area. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, beginning, the works of the flesh are these which are manifest. It goes down about verse 22 and says, but the works of the Spirit are these. So if you're to put a, put a big capital T on the wall up here, and on one side you label it works of the flesh, and on the other side you label it works of the, uh, works of the, uh, works of the Spirit, there's no gray area on that perpendicular for the things I, I like to do. The Bible doesn't say I can't. The Bible says, don't do this. But yet, if you look at the, the, the sins, he says, and such like, the things that I've left out. In the military, we've got Article 134, the Uniform Court of Military Justice. And what that says, Article 134, what that says is everything, anything and everything not covered in 1 through 33, 1 through 33, we got here, brother. 
Well, it doesn't say not. Well, 134, you got to read it. I, I said, man, man. We should always keep in mind that God has provided a way for man to overcome himself. John 3, 16. For God's love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The grace of God, um, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, uh, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. What should I do? Let's just see what Jesus said to do and do that. So what must I do to be saved? The Ethiopian eunuch, basic, um, no, it was a Philippian jailer that asked that. He came down in front of Paul and Silas in the prison that night. After the earthquake had opened up the doors of the jail and, and, and shed the shackles on all the prisoners, and the jailer came out and saw what had happened after that earthquake hit, and he's getting ready to fall on his own sword, and Paul said, don't do it, we're all here. The jailer came in and fell down at his feet and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They spoke unto him the word of the Lord. Well, what did the Lord say? What did the Lord say? I mean, if, if they spoke unto him the words of the Lord, and he was then baptized, what did the Lord say? Well, the Lord said, and in um, uh, John 6, 44 and 45, they shall all be taught of God. He that learned, heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. John 8 and verse 24, Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, in context, the Messiah, ye shall die in your sins. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, except you repent, ye shall die in your, likewise die in your sins. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, except you confess me before men, I will not confess you before my heavenly Father. And that is a verbal confession, but it's also my lifestyle. The word there means all the things connected with my life. So my life has to be that which glorifies God. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, I'll give unto thee the crown of life. So it's not just enough to have obeyed the gospel initially. I then must continually be obedient to the gospel of Christ until I draw my last breath. So, if you haven't done that, we encourage you to do so. Why? Because none of us has tomorrow. None of us has tomorrow. We may not even have lunchtime, and it's coming up shortly. Think about that. You may not make it to lunch. So what do you do? Well, first of all, you make sure, well, I don't believe in deathbed confessions. Listen, I don't care. I mean, I, I honestly, if somebody at the last moment says, I want to be baptized, I'm going to ask him a few questions, we're going to do it. I'll let the Lord sort it out. That's my, that's my personal view on that thing. But do, just simply do what Jesus... Well, my preacher said... Well, your preacher, if your preacher didn't say what Jesus said, he's wrong. I'll be glad to tell him if you want me to. I don't care. But if we do what Jesus said to do, and he said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. If you love Jesus and do what he says to do, he's promised to save you. Uh, Revelation 1 and verse 5, uh, he wa uh, we washed us in his... In his we washed ourselves in his blood. In Revelation 7, 14, John, uh, the angel told John, uh, the, those folks robed in white, these are they that have, wa that, that have washed, no, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. In Revelation 1, 5, it's Jesus washing us in his blood. In Revelation 7, 14, it's those in white that washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. So it's a mutual process. We submit and Jesus does the deed. So if I do that, for the reasons Jesus said, told those folks back then to do it, I will be today what they were back then. I will be washed. I will be sanctified. It will be meat for the master's use. According to Acts 2, verse 47, the Lord adds the church daily to the church that should be saved. So, if you've not done that, do that. If you have, but you've been unfaithful, come back. If you need our prayers, let's pray for you. Bible study, that's what we're here for. And, and since I'll be leaving here shortly, you'll need to be finding somebody to help you with that. And there's folks who'll be glad to help you. But if you need to respond to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come. Why don't you understand? As we sing the hymn of the day.